Something strange is going on. Who is killing Russian billionaires? Another Russian oligarch has been found dead. Reports suggest that he hanged himself, fell out of a window, slashed his wrists, was poisoned, murdered his whole family. Last year, more than a dozen Russian oligarchs died in the space of nine months. Many of the deaths are suspicious with links to the Kremlin. This is Sad Oligarch, an investigation into these recently dead Russian billionaires. It's created by me, Jake Hanrahan, and my colleague, Sergei Slipchenko. Sad Oligarch is a H11 production for Kuzo Media and iHeartRadio. One day after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, Alexander Tyulokov hanged himself in the garage of his villa in Russia's Leningrad Oblast, specifically the village of Leninskoya. Tyulokov was 61 years old. According to multiple sources from Russian media, a suicide note was found next to the body. Its contents, though, have yet to be revealed in full. Tulakov worked for Gazprom, a multinational energy corporation owned in the majority by the Russian government. Tulakov was the deputy general director of Gazprom's Unified Settlement Center for Corporate Security, a serious role. Leninskoya, where he lived and died, has been nicknamed by locals as Gazprom's Nest, as so many Gazprom managers have houses there. Tulakov was wealthy and his house in Leninskoya showed it. The Tulakov house was surrounded by beautiful conifer trees and set back in the woods. A nice place to live. The minimum cost of an average house in that area is upward of $500,000. Tulakov's corpse was found by a woman he lived with and her ex-husband. It's unsure if the woman was his girlfriend or just rented a room at the house. Either way, the body was discovered hanged in a noose in the garage and the police were called. The police arrived and got to work. Then, a short time later, something strange happened. As police tended to the scene, three black jeeps pulled up outside the house. Several men got out. They belonged to Gazprom's private security. They immediately pushed out the police investigators, cordoned off the area and seized the evidence. Independent Russian newspaper Novaya Gazeta, an adversarial outlet that's known for being critical of the Kremlin, interviewed people at the scene. They spoke to an employee of the investigative committee for the Leningrad region. This person, who wished to remain anonymous, said the following, quote, Everything that concerns the village of Leninskoya is immediately reported to us. Personally, I saw a man in a noose with some piece of paper lying on the floor of the garage. Forensic specialists were already working when strong-looking guys arrived in three jeeps. They declared they were Gazprom's security service. They cordoned off the territory and we and most of the policemen were simply sent away outside of the cordon of the house. End quote. Who were these people? How is it that Gazprom security was able to outrank the police? To get an idea of how security works at Gazprom, we looked at local job postings in Russia for security services in the Gazprom companies. Sergey explains. I couldn't find like a specific company or like a specific, I guess, I don't know, like section of Gazprom that specifically has security. Like when they're when you're like here's a job offering for a security guard. Uh, and it basically just says you're working for Gazprom, главное управление охраны, which just means like the main security head of Gazprom. You know, there's no like separate entity or anything. It seems to be just like internal Gazprom uh, security guards. And from my understanding, that's basically who came, kicked the police out. I don't know for sure, but going based off other uh, kind of other situation and from what I understand how Russia operates, my guess would be the cops kind of understand that once Gazprom is there, it's kind of above the, their pay grade. I think they know that like if Gazprom security is there, 
you know, very connected to Putin, to the Russian higher ups. I think they know kind of uh, it's time to to pack up and step out of the way. Uh, so anything related to security, they always look for um, military service. Currently, a company called Radu is doing the recruiting for Gazprom security. That's who's hiring from the job offer Sergi was reading. Radu is a Russian private military contractor and security firm. It's even formed its own mercenary units sent out to fight against Ukraine. Through Radu, Gazprom itself also has a private military contractor unit taking part in the Russian invasion of Ukraine right now. Recently, this unit released a video condemning another Russian private military contractor unit who they'd clash with in an occupied area of Ukraine. So one Russian PMC is fighting with another Russian PMC whilst both are sent on the same mission by private Russian government-linked firms to invade a foreign country. It's extremely messy, but as you can see, Gazprom is not just an energy company. Essentially, Gazprom holds a lot more power across Russia, much more is at stake for its executives. To understand Gazprom's power and how Alexander Tyolokov might have gotten on the wrong side of that, we need to look at where Gazprom came from. Gazprom's origins date back to the 1940s when Russia was ruled by Stalin's Soviet Union, the USSR. In 1943, in the midst of World War II, the USSR formed its first domestic gas industry. It was later centralized as the Ministry of Gas, which discovered large natural gas reserves in the 1970s and 80s. This helped the USSR become a major player in the gas industry. By 1983, the USSR was the world's leading producer of natural gas. They exported the gas to many countries across Western Europe, something the USSR became dependent on to keep the country going. Ironic considering that now it's Western European countries that are the most dependent on Russia's gas exports. By 1989, the Ministry of Gas was renamed as the State Gas Concern Gazprom. The name Gazprom is a mix of two words in Russian that simply means gas industry. The renamed department was Gazprom in its infancy as it became the USSR's first state-run corporation. When the USSR collapsed in 1991, most of Gazprom was transferred to state-owned companies and the assets remained in Russia. Everyone involved formed a total gas sector monopoly. Gazprom grew rapidly, extending its branches into many other industries such as banking, media, security and oil. This monopolized major state-owned energy company exporting internationally gave the Russian government big leverage. By 2007, the number of Gazprom's personnel was more than 400,000 people. It became the world's largest supplier of natural gas with an estimated annual net profit of over $9 billion. By 2020, Germany, Italy and the Netherlands were Gazprom's biggest customers outside of regions within the former Soviet Union. By 2022, Gazprom was sporadically shutting off gas to Western Europe as a threat to countries helping Ukraine resist Putin's invasion. Putin allegedly owns 4.5% of Gazprom himself, adding to his hidden fortune, which is speculated to be around 200 billion dollars. In 2012, the independent Russian news outlet The Moscow Times compared Gazprom to an organized crime syndicate. They said, quote, Gazprom in many ways is more important in advancing the Kremlin's foreign policy than the defense ministry or the foreign ministry. In short, the way Gazprom is run is an accurate model for how Putin rules Russia. Since 2001, Gazprom's management has been dominated by three groups. The CEO's Young St. Petersburg Economists, a group of St. Petersburg KGB officers, both closely linked to Putin, and a third group of old Gazprom officials. 
Putin himself has arbitrated between these three factions, preventing any one of them from gaining the upper hand. Using a classic divide and rule strategy, Putin thus retains the ultimate responsibility for the company. End quote. The KGB that's mentioned in that quote was, of course, the Soviet Union's notoriously brutal security and intelligence agency. The spiritual successor to that is the FSB, the current Russian security and intelligence agency. Many interchangeably refer to the current day FSB as the KGB. Clearly, it's no secret that Gazprom has a sizable FSB Putin loyalist presence within the inner circles, specifically in St. Petersburg. But was Alexander Tuyolokov part of that? It's possible. Turns out he actually used to work for the FSB through the early 90s. Then in 1999, he began working for Gazprom in where? St. Petersburg. A decade after that, in 2009, he became Gazprom's Deputy General Director and then Deputy for Corporate Protection and Personnel Management. I think it's safe to say it's not unlikely that Tyolokov at least had some proximity to this FSB circle within Gazprom. It's worth noting that largely the FSB is alleged to carry out any dirty work for the Kremlin, including extrajudicial violence. But what has all this got to do with Tyolokov hanging himself in his garage? There's more to this story. Reports in the media from an unnamed witness at the scene say that Tyolokov returned home bruised and beaten the day before he was found dead. He looked as if someone had beaten him up. As we mentioned earlier, Tyolokov was the Deputy General Director of Gazprom's Unified Settlement Centre for corporate security. The Unified Settlement Center acts as the Gazprom Treasury. According to journalist Matthew Cooper, there were rumors in Russia that there were problems there. It's alleged that a hole was found in a 2021 internal corporate audit. Cooper writes, quote, According to people in the know, most likely, Tyolokov's structure failed to avoid sanctions losses, which divided the life of a top manager into before and after. End quote. Still, these are just rumors. What isn't rumor, though, is the removal of Alexander Tyolokov's photos from Gazprom files. When reporters from Novaya Gazeta requested images of Tyolokov from Gazprom so that they could use it in their article, they'd all been removed. Russian journalist Maxim Leonov wrote about this, saying, quote, The central office of Gazprom said that they did not have any information about an investigation into the death of Alexander Tyolokov. At the same time, we were not even able to obtain photographs of the deceased. One of the employees of the press service of Gazprom admitted that the photos of Tyolokov were removed from their sites in order to prevent the spread of rumors and to spare the nerves of the relatives and friends of the victims. End quote. This is odd. Why remove the photos? And so quickly. Gazprom's reasoning is that it could cause pain for the family if the photos are left in the Gazprom files. I'd argue that it's a lot more painful for the family if a company erases their loved ones from the records immediately after their suicide. This is what Gazprom did to Alexander Tyolokov after he'd worked there in a very prestigious position for more than 20 years. They wiped him off the face of the planet as far as Gazprom is concerned. And not to mention the fact that Gazprom security took over the scene and pushed out the police. And yet they said that they were unaware of any investigation into Alexander Tyolokov's suicide. All of this, to me, seems even more unusual when you consider that Alexander Tyolokov was not the first Gazprom suicide at the so-called Gazprom Nest last year. On January 29th, 2022, Gazprom executive Leonid Shulman was found dead at his home with both wrists slashed. A suicide note was found next to his body. 
This occurred just 27 days before Alexander Tiolokov was found dead in the same area, just down the road, also with a suicide note next to his body. Reports are conflicting on who found him. Some say it was his ex-wife and children, some say his girlfriend, and some say the police were first to turn up. Leonid Shulman was the head of transport services at the investment subsidiary of Gazprom. Shulman, who was 60 years old when he died, lived in an affluent gated community in the same area as Tuyolokov. Both were residents at Gazprom's nest. Shulman was found dead in his bathroom with his wrist cut open. According to reports, a utility knife was found by his side, as well as the suicide note. We looked at the police photos from the scene. The bathroom has an all marble finish with the bath to the right of the room. The bathtub is filled around halfway with blood and water. Shulman's corpse is lying face down on the floor beside the bath. Blood is smeared on the marble near his feet. Shulman has a metal Ilizarov apparatus around the lower half of the right leg. This is an external fixator which stabilizes and holds broken bones into their correct position to help them heal. Shulman had a complicated bone fracture after a recent accident. The fixator on his leg appears to be broken with loose parts on the floor next to Shulman's feet. Crutches are laid out on the floor across the room next to where Shulman's head is positioned. Shulman's body appears to be laid out on top of towels or a blanket. What's not visible in the photo is the suicide note or the utility knife the Russian authorities say Shulman killed himself with. We do though have other police photos of the suicide note removed from the scene. It was written in a notebook. Whether the photos of the bathroom scene were taken after the note was removed or if it was out of shot or if it wasn't even there, we don't know. The following is from Shulman's suicide notes, which was published in Russian media. Quote, I'm tired of having to deal with constant medical treatment. I don't want to become an invalid or a burden. Remember me as happy and cheerful. Yours, Lenya. Dad, thank you, sunshine, for everything. P.S. I love you all. End quote. Lenya is short for Leonide. There's more to the suicide note, but the rest has been blurred out, presumably by the Russian authorities before it was released publicly. According to this suicide note and Russian state media reports, Shulman killed himself due to the complications with his fractured right leg. Whilst we don't know if there were further unknown medical problems with it, the fractured leg alone seems an unusual reason to kill yourself as a wealthy 60-year-old. The Elizarov apparatus he had installed is painful, sure, but this can be somewhat alleviated with medication. Shulman had money. He had access to premium healthcare. He would have, of course, had access to strong painkillers. Nevertheless, apparently he killed himself in the bath by slitting both his wrists with a utility knife, also known as a Stanley knife or a box cutter. Shulman then, perhaps in a bid to try and save himself, climbed out of the bath before falling flat and dying on the tiles. That's what the official story and the police crime scene photos suggest anyway. As is with many of these oligarch deaths, we've discovered that there's more to it. Multiple Russian state-backed media sources mentioned that there was an internal investigation into the finances of vehicle repairs in the department that Shulman headed at Gazprom. It seems like there was an investigation into why the company was bleeding money. There was a, like a reshuffling in, I think, 2020 or so. And it was kind of promised as, you know, we're, we'll change the structure, we'll change the higher-ups, and the company's going to get more profits. But instead, it kept on dropping. Perhaps one of those reasons that was identified was corruption, right? People are stealing money off, you know, the typical order or some kind of repair order parts and half of those parts aren't actually purchased half of the money is pocketed uh it seems like shulman he was somewhere higher up in the transport unit he would have been the one responsible for ordering any kind of repairs approving uh deliveries uh, orders sergi looked into an open source database online documenting these orders in shulman's department this one specifically is called uh, Hoz Zakupok, like gas prompts purchasing 
portal, I guess. They show which purchases are made. Uh, it shows uh, when it was ordered, if it was repeated, and then it shows the total price. This is where evidence of corruption in Shulman's department is set out in black and white on the order forms. Two identical purchases were made for repairs two months from each other for 1.2 million rubles. So that's about 15,000 or 16,000 US dollars. Kind of a lot for only two months in between, like how many cars you're fixing, how many cars are actually like needing this maintenance, right? Uh, Schulman uh, would probably be the one that would like uh, authorize this, perhaps even make the order himself. This kind of activity is pretty normal, you know, order something, skim half of it and just report that the entire like order was made and came, but it doesn't exist. So he's potentially took about 15 grand back home out of that from doing absolutely nothing but faking some documents. Yeah, you know, just file a couple extra reports, file a couple extra, I don't know, maintenance um, ledgers, you know, say you fixed X many cars, uh, say you needed a couple more tires or whatever, you know, make it look clean. Uh, it never actually happened, but I mean, who's going to really prove at that point is probably what they thought. Um, I don't think they expected to have that investigation started. From what I understand, the investigation was coming to a close. Uh, they never, it was in like a private internal investigation, so not much details came out about it. But it seems like around the time they died, the investigation was coming to a close. Schulman specifically was kind of um, aware that he would be identified as the guy stealing money and maybe he offed himself. Um, it's very possible that he might have been made an example. You know, if you steal from us, this is what happens. Um, mostly speculation, but the fact remains that it's pretty weird circumstances. Same village. Um, I don't know if they actually knew each other, but clearly they worked in the same structure, like same uh, company structure, you know. they. I'm sure they knew of each other, especially when they lived so nearby. A pro-Kremlin media outlet called the Moscow Post had a reporter on the ground in the region where Shulman died. They also speculate that he was stealing money from Gazprom through the fake orders. They back this up with some pretty convincing evidence, which, if it's pro-Kremlin media as this is, it can be sort of considered almost as a reworked press release from the state. This evidence shows purchase orders from Shulman's department for parts for cars that were purposely overpriced. Who did the extra money go to? As Sergi just explained, probably Shulman. The Moscow Post also shows that vehicles in Shulman's department were, on paper, excessively serviced. Services were also overpriced. Seeing as Shulman was in charge of all of this, he was quite likely the one skimming off the top. This, I think, leads to three possible realities. One, Shulman actually did kill himself due to the pain in his leg. Two, Shulman killed himself because he knew he might be going to prison after stealing from Gazprom. And three, Shulman was murdered due to his theft from Gazprom. Me and Sergi were speaking about this specifically with regards to Putin's close proximity to Gazprom and how he feels people engaged in corruption are stealing right out of his pocket. I remember Putin talking about um, kind of selling Russia and that's what he described Ukraine as, right? In 2014, he says that like the politicians that did the whole revolution, well, according to him, it was like all orchestrated, right? He's saying, he calls that like selling out to the West, sort of along the lines of if you're stealing from Russia, you're a traitor, you're as, you're as bad as like those in the West, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think that would be a view he holds, you know, um, although I don't think he sees it as stealing from Russia, I think he sees it as stealing from himself or kind of from his group, you know, it's like, if you're, if you're going against the grain in his group, you're wrong. Like he doesn't care if he's stealing from the Russian people, if he's taking money from, you know, Gazprom, whatever other state um, company, like, I don't think that phases him at all. It's when you do something that's kind of like, I guess what you think you, you had one over Putin himself. And I think that extends, it's just the kind of culture, like it's embarrassing to him. And if you embarrass him, that's like, that's more than enough. This is a very relevant theory. Remember, Putin allegedly owns 4.5% of Gazprom himself. Gazprom is massive. 
It holds around 15% of all global gas reserves, has branched off into banking, media and oil, and now even has its own paramilitary forces on the ground invading Ukraine. Earlier this year, Putin lauded Gazprom in a video address to the CEO. He said, quote, The whole of Russia is proud of Gazprom. Over the previous 30 years, global gas consumption has almost doubled, and in the next 20 years, according to expert estimates, it will add at least another 20%. Despite unfair competition, direct attempts from the outside to hinder and restrain its development, Gazprom is moving forward, launching new projects. End quote. It's clear Gazprom holds a special place in Putin's heart. If someone steals from Gazprom, they're quite literally stealing from part of his empire. Anyone working relatively high up at Gazprom will know this. Leonid Shulman would have known this. He took a risk and was likely found out. It's very possible that Leonid Shulman just understood what it meant if he was found out. And he was kind of like, you know what, fuck it. I'll do it myself. Very possible. You know, uh, he got into this knowing what he's doing, who he's dealing with. Uh, and, and, you know, there's so many other cases of falling out of windows even before all this. I think he knew what was coming probably. I think it's like an uh, open secret that the way Russia is run, uh, I think a lot of people in Russia understand that as well. Um, but I think they still don't want to air their dirty laundry completely. You know, I mean, look at Tulyakov, February 25th, right? 2022, literally the day, I think it was the morning of uh, the, in the invasion. Um, it's pretty convenient timing. Maybe uh, Tulyakov just kind of off himself, knowing the pressure and what was coming. But February 25th, he's found beat up or at least very bruised the previous day, you know, and then all of a sudden he takes his life. You know, maybe maybe he just kind of knew what was coming and decided to do it. Or they used the very big, you know, huge news that was taking all over all the news media for the next like month or so, the Ukraine war. Uh, it's a great thing to kind of uh, squeeze in the death there. Nobody would probably even notice. Sad Oligarch is a H11 production for Cool Zone Media and iHeart Radio. Hosted, produced, researched, and edited by me, Jake Hanrahan, and Sergi Slipchenko. Co produced by Sophie Lichterman. Music by Sam Black. Artwork by Adam Doyle. Sound mix by Splicing Block. Go to jakehanrahan.com for more information. Hey.